Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday, the 19th of July. Now, numbers of the SARS coronavirus 2 infection are pretty high. Let's just have a look at some of the data. I'm not going to bore you with too much data on this video, but let's just see where we are uh, at. Um, this is the COVID symptom tracker data, and we see that this is actually the highest level we've been to in the Omicron wave. So very, very high levels of infection. We're looking at about 1 in 14, 1 in 15 people in the country currently infected. Incredibly high numbers. Now, um, we haven't got firm data for the United States the way we have for the United Kingdom, but if we look at it, we can get some pretty good, um, some pretty good uh, indicators of where the United States is at. And uh, here we see it here. So the cases obviously are pretty irrelevant because we don't have the testing. But the increase in hospitalizations in the United States, and that's the deaths there, which are fairly flat to low. This is a very comparable picture to what we're getting in the United Kingdom. So I suspect that the infections in the United States are really quite similar because we're getting similar increases in hospitalization, not huge increases, and the patients aren't particularly ill, but nevertheless uh, comparable. So where are we going with this virus at the moment is the key thing. Now, I actually um, anticipated this pandemic in uh, January 2020, so got that bit right. Uh, I anticipated we could eradicate the disease altogether, got that bit completely wrong, that's not happening in the foreseeable future. And then uh, I anticipated we would reach a stage of sort of equilibrium of endemicity, and so far that hasn't happened either. So um, quite a few things, a couple of things I've got wrong there. A lot of other people have got it wrong as well. Um, so always good to clarify and get bang up to date as to where to where we really are. And what we're entering really, I think we could call now, um, and I'm just making this up at the moment, but a, a period of unstable uh, endemicity. Now let's look, let's look at what's happening. So here we have, here we have the... Um, evolutionary driver now this is quite important now the evolutionary drivers for the early waves were the fact that it spread more readily so so the the alpha uh, the delta it spread more quickly um, now it's not increased rate of transmission that's causing these massive huge waves and the increase in numbers it's the immune escape so the virus is escaping immunity generated by vaccination it's escaping immunity generated by um, a previous infection this is the current evolutionary driver. And uh, it looks like it may carry on in this vein for the time being because this virus is already pretty well as transmissible as you can get. It's incredibly uh, transmissible. So there, 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 there we see that change. It was increased transmission. Uh, now it's immune escape. We're getting reinfected at a frightening rate ability to reinfect those that have already been infected or indeed vaccinated. Now, let's look at some evidence for this. Now, this comes from the Australian Health Protection uh, Principal Committee. And of course, I put the, uh, the link up there. You can check it out for yourself. Do check out these references. Um, reinfection may occur as early as 28 days after recovery. Now, we had been saying three months and then we, we, look, we looked at uh, Tim Spector's data just a few days ago, and some cases were less than three months. The Australian data is now saying, and, and the Australian data is dealing with the BA4, BA5, pri pri primarily the BA5. And, and that's coming to the conclusion it's down to 28 days. So this is really quite, well, I suppose the word could be impressive, um, if that's the, the right word to use. Impressive performance by the virus, bad for us. As early as 28 days, people who test positive to COVID more than 28 days after end or ending isolation due to previous infection should be reported and managed as new cases, 28 days. So there we have it in official black and white. And the, this is a direct quote here from the Australian authorities. And they agree BA4 or 5 associated with, associated with immune escape. Rates of reinfection rise amongst previously infected and those um, up to date with that. So infections, including those who are up to date with the vaccines. And they do say this, and this is an important caveat. Vaccination continues to be the most important protection against severe illness. So I think this is important to note. So we're getting a fairly similar message from the Australian government working independently uh, from the UK government, working independently from, from the US or, or authorities. Now, we can't take everything that all the authorities say as at face value, of course. 
But um, the, 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 this reinfection after 28 days is evidence based. And the fact that the vaccines are still protecting against the most severe forms of the disease is important. Now, what it doesn't say is how long this protection against severe disease lasts. That's what's unclear in my mind. I don't know of the data that's clear that says a booster is going to improve your uh, chances of not getting severely ill, although it would be reasonable to assume that that is the case. But all governments are saying this, so, so I think it's only dutiful to report that. A lot of debate around the vaccines. We can say that vaccination is not protecting those around us now, or to a negligible extent, because of the the, immune, the immunity wearing off so quickly. So a reason to get vaccinated is not to protect those around us, as we once believed in any realistic, practical way. But to prevent severe illness and death is still what we are being uh, told. And the evidence is there. The evidence is there. If we look at the alpha waves that killed lots of people in the UK in the Delta wave, they simply weren't dying because they were protected against severe illness and death by the vaccine. So we need to keep this in some sort of a some sort of perspective. Now, just the rate of infections, English school attendance, 19 percent of pupils were absent. Then now this is this is about the 6th of July, I think. Um, Eight percent of teachers off work. NHS. Um, 6th of July data from the NHS. That was the latest we have from the NHS. 26,874 people off sick with COVID. Now, um, quite a, a lot of these, of course, were acute COVID, but quite a few of these were long COVID as well. So we've got the acute and the chronic. The, these, this is a major impact on the health and economic well-being of countries at the moment. Um, it, it's, it's really quite big. These numbers are huge and comparable numbers in different parts of the world. Uh, Stephen Keisler, epidemiologist, Harvard. The way that the pandemic has played out is uh, continuing, uh, and as continuing to play out, it's unexpected. It is. We'd expected strong seasonal wintertime patterns where you don't see a lot outside those winter months. Well, no, this is what we'd expect for, for a winter virus. Everyone's huddled together when it's uh, indoors, when it's um, when it's cold, you get a lot of spread. The kind of exception there might be in the southern United States, where in summertime a lot of people uh, tend to congregate together where it's too hot outside in air conditioning. But basically these viruses spread in winter and we're not seeing this. So it's good to see that other uh, people are admitting their mistakes as they go along as well. And of course, these, these are very uh, senior people that I'm quoting. And of course, uh, um, if I'm getting them wrong, they're always welcome to come um, and correct it. But th this is my best understanding of what they are saying. Um, I would have thought it had reached a steady state by now, or, uh, as we said, a, a, a steady equilibrium, but it's not. It's, it's an unsteady equilibrium. Seems the opposite of the case. Professor Openshaw, uh, immunologist, uh, they're actually becoming more frequent. Talking about the waves, the waves are becoming more frequent. We'd expected to get the summer off. Now, if you remember, if you remember, like um, summer 2021, we kind of had that off really because then we had we had the the, the infectious cases. Uh, the, the virus was getting more infectious, but we didn't have this immune escape. So we we had a, a sort of a very quiet summer, uh, but whereas now we're we're not seeing that, and the immune escape is the me mechanism for this. Uh, so the waves are actually becoming more frequent, piling on top of one another. Now, if we let nature follow its course, we will reach some sort of equilibrium. Now, it's good to see. Now, I think Professor Openshaw here is um, making a nod towards um, natural immunity. At least I think he is. If I'm wrong, then please, please uh, hopefully Professor will, will correct me. But but that's the way I'm seeing this. Um, it may mean coexisting uh, with a lower level of health overall do we really have an alternative now um, to let nature taking its course we will look at some people what they say about that uh, uh, Tim Cook an ethetist uh, in many settings COVID is an inconvenience now now I, I, I've been saying this for some time and I'm not saying this should happen but I am saying that sooner or later someone in the health service in another services around the world I've got to say well we're not going to test for COVID anymore. This is endemic, same as so many other viruses. When someone comes into hospital, you don't test for 16 different viruses or 200 different viral infections. We just know that these infections are out there and sooner or later, COVID is going to have to, someone's going to have to take that decision sooner or later. Um, I don't think anyone is jumping up to the plate to take that decision. 
um, because um, yeah, what what what? Why take decisions if you don't have to? <laughs> um, it doesn't seem to be happening. Um, so an inconvenience rather than a threat to life. Thankfully, that is the case. Uh, significant impact on healthcare for sure, but particularly the, a lot of the impact is because we're having to do um, the, all of the isolation. If we didn't have to do that, the impact would be less. And sooner or later, that decision is going to have to be taken. To be quite honest, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to take it. And I, I think a lot of people are sort of thinking about that. Well, I, I'm not going to take this decision yet, but sooner or later. Anyway, I've made that point. Um, so, um, yeah, the pandemic's not over, that, that's for sure. Professor Adam uh, Finn, paediatrics and also part of the vaccination committee. Um, we've more or less given up on the idea of mass immunisation to control the spread of infection. So we're not getting vaccinated uh, to protect those around us. That era has passed. The immune escape means that that is essentially now uh, impossible. So glad to see him saying that. Um, uh, vaccinating everyone every three months is just not feasible. And who'd want one anyway? It's vaccinating everyone, it's just not feasible. So, it, but he does go on, or, or the article I was reading, so talk about um, variant uh, proof vaccines. Uh, a, a vaccine which would be useful in all um, coronavirus infections. Or nasal vaccines. So th these are possibly ways that we could go. Um, although... I would prefer to see more talk about natural immunity, which I think at the, in the end has got to be better than vaccination. One thing they're talking about is the nasal vaccines. Because, of course, if you get infected through the, uh, the nose, it goes into the respiratory passages and you get this surface immunity. The, these immunoglobulin type A's that sit on the surface of the mucous um, membranes, which a nasal vaccine would give. But, of course, natural infection gives that as well already. So any... Re no reason there really to say that a, a nasal vaccine would be better than exposure to the natural infection. So that, 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 that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Massive, huge numbers, no obvious end in sight, very rapid evolution due to immune escape and um, somewhat divided expert opinion, but somewhat coalescing around the fact that we can't keep vaccinating people every three months, but agreement uh, that vaccination, at least vaccination in the past, has protected against severe disease and deaths, especially in the older age groups. I think this completely changes the risk-benefit analysis for vaccinating young people. If they're not at very significant risk and they're not going to protect their parents and grandparents at home, then I think uh, that really, really changes the risk-benefit analysis of vaccinating um, young children. Now, just finally been asked lots of questions about this the principal trial oxford university of course uh, two years on where are we at with it well here's the timeline so for example here ivermectin june uh, 2021 added to the trial now june 2021 was 13 months ago so uh, let's look at the results of, of this of this uh, trial um oh we don't have them yet uh, for vipavir and ivermectin still being studied in the trial. A um, little bit on the slow side, so if anyone from Oxford wants to come on and talk to us, of course they are more than welcome. So there we go. Um, unstable endemicity is, is what I think I might call this video. And uh, thank you for watching.